You all knock me out. Yeah, it's gonna be warm. Oh, wow. oh my goodness, Randy. You, you could have left it off, Randy. Is somebody looking for us? <laughs> this this is crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh. We have a lot of interns in here. A lot of students. This is great. Hi, students. Hi, interns. You having a good summer? Good. Good. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I, before we start with our agenda, I do want to take a minute to discuss some troubling recent developments in our city. Respect for the laws, democratic governance, and the separation of powers is the foundation of representative democracy that underpins our city's local government. When these norms are eroded, the result is a weakened democracy. The effect is a government that is less responsive to those that it represents and the lowering of safeguards that protect the public interest. Over the past few months, we've seen attacks against the rule of law with unprecedented disregard for laws passed by the independent legislative branch, abusing the power to declare a state of emergency. We've seen a rush charter revision commission that circumvented the public transparency, feedback, and scrutiny of the legislative process to advance certain changes to law that do not require a charter revision commission or voter ref referendum. An independent and separate legislative branch of government is essential to hold the executive branch accountable. As the city's legislature, the city council changes laws throughout a robust, open legislative process where the public can provide input and testify. On average, a public safety bill goes from introduction to passage in 292 days, and all other bills take 280 days. In the process, we hear from all stakeholders, including the executive branch and its relevant agencies, advocates working on the issues, and members of the public. This is how we craft thoughtful and meaningful legislation that improves the lives of New Yorkers by ensuring city agencies meet their needs. It is ironic and an immense hypocrisy that the commission inaccurately claimed deficiencies in the legislative process to justify its actions when it actually failed to come anywhere close to meeting the baseline expectations of the council's process. The commission existed for less than 60 days and released concrete proposals less than two days before voting on them with absolutely no opportunity for public testimony on them. In fact, it even amended those proposals just hours before its final vote with no public notice or explanation of its changes until minutes before voting. The commission claimed these changes were the prod product of being responsive to feedback, but the reality is that they occurred after learning of the threat of lawsuits to reduce their risk of legal exposure. At the same time, other changes proposed by the commission have sought to give the executive branch unprecedented control over the legislative branch's processes, centralizing more power within the executive branch by giving it control over the independent legislative branch's process sets a dangerous precedent. It would leave the government less responsive to New Yorkers and have long-term implications for the functioning of our city that go beyond this current administration and council. This isn't about a disagreement between this mayor and council. It's no longer about advice and consent. This is about our local democracy and whether we have the government that is accountable to the people of our city. This is tantamount to mayoral control over the duly elected legislative branch of the city of New York. We've also seen independent oversight agencies become the target of attacks 
whether it is those responsible for civilian complaints of police abuse or campaign finance. This disregard of democratic governance and processes cannot be normalized. The strength of our city, our government, and our democracy relies on upholding these principles that safeguard public confidence and trust in our institutions. It is important for all of us not to lose sight of this by minimizing these circumstances as routine to the political process, because it is not, and it should not be and it should not be unless we're all okay with losing the strength of our democracy. Now we'll move on to our stated agenda. First, we'll vote on the following land use items. Bronx Metro North stations rezoning. A neighborhood rezoning boosted by a historic commitment of local infrastructure and neighborhood investments secured by the council that will add approximately 7,000 new homes, revitalize the local economy, and activate key corridors surrounding forthcoming Metro North stations in the East Bronx. The council proposes to modify this series of applications from the New York City Department of City Planning to better align with neighborhood character by adjusting heights and densities in key areas, returning minimum parking requirements to to those in the existing zoning and adjusting MIH options to better reflect uh, incomes throughout the Parkchester, Van Nest, and Morris Park neighborhoods in the Bronx. These land use changes will facilitate the creation of new housing and home ownership opportunities at a time when our city faces a dire housing crisis with not enough homes for New Yorkers. To support the development facil facilitated by this zoning, the council has secured a capital commitment package from the administration totaling approximately $500 million that will provide upgrades to parks and open space, improvements to local schools, street safety improvements that will benefit pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers alike, critical investments to sewer, water line, and flood infrastructure, and capital funding for upgrades to the 49th precinct. This historic investment and planning effort would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of Majority Leader Amanda Farias, Land Use Committee Chair Rafael Salamanca, Zoning Subcommittee Chair Kevin Riley, and Council Member Christy Marmorado. We also thank the Department of City Planning and Administration. 3033 Avenue V rezoning will facilitate a new nine-story mixed-use development, including ground floor retail and approximately 109 housing units, 27 of which are affordable units in the Sheepshead Bay area of Brooklyn in Councilmember Narcissus District. The council proposes to modify these actions by removing MIH option two and adding the deep affordability option. 197 Berry Street rezoning will reduce existing development parking requirements from 142 accessory parking spaces to 42 in order to convert existing parking spaces to a self-storage facility containing 300 self-storage units in the Williamsburg in the Williamsburg neighborhood of Brooklyn in Councilmember Gutierrez's district. The remaining 42 parking spaces would remain accessory to the residential building. Wings and Seafood Sidewalk Cafe, the council will vote on disapproval of an application for a revocable consent to operate a sidewalk cafe in Councilmember Holden's district. We will also vote on two applications in Councilmember Wrestler's district. 500 Kent Avenue will facilitate the development of a new 23-story commercial building with ground floor retail and waterfront public access in the Williamsburg neighborhood in Brooklyn. The council proposes to modify these actions by clarifying in the associated restrictive declaration how certain mitigation measures will be coordinated with appropriate city agencies. 712 Myrtle Avenue will facilitate the construction of a nine-story mixed-use building with approximately 62 units, including 15 permanently affordable units in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn. The council proposes to modify these actions by removing MIH option two and adding the deep affordability option. Lastly, in the area of land use, we will be voting on two applications in Minority Leader Borelli's district. Arthur Kill Terminal, a zoning text amendment, landfill action, special permit, and city map change to facilitate the development of a waterfront site just south of the Outer Bridge Crossing in Staten Island into a Marie Terminal specifically designed for the staging and assembly of offshore wind components, which are essential to supporting New York's transition to green, renewable energy. The Council proposes to modify the proposed text Text amendment to require that any project seeking City Planning Commission authorization for zoning relief under the proposed text amendment must support the city's green energy infrastructure. And Princess Point. 
will facilitate the construction of new map streets and the development of 108 detached single-family homes in the Prince Bay neighborhood of Staten Island. Next, we'll vote on the following finance items. A transparency resolution approving new designations and changes of certain organizations receiving funding in the expense budget. A pre-considered resolution sponsored by Councilmember Justin Brannon amending an existing 40-year Article 5 tax exemption for one rent-stabilized building in Deputy Speaker Ayala's district. A pre-considered resolution sponsored by Councilmember Brannon renewing an existing 40-year Article 5 tax exemption for the preservation of one rent-stabilized building in Deputy Speaker Ayala's district. A pre-considered resolution sponsored by Councilmember Brannon authorizing a 40-year Ar Article 11 tax exemption for the preservation of one rent-stabilized building in Councilmember Salam's district. And a pre-considered re uh, resolution sponsored by Councilmember Brannon authorizing a 40-year Article 11 tax exemption for the preservation of one rent-stabilized senior building in Councilmember Salam's district. The Bronx, Manhattan, and Queensboro delegations of the Council have also approved the following appointments to the Department for Aging. Uh, for the uh, Aging's Advisory Council that will be voted on. Sophia L. Reed, uh, Mayung Mi Kim, and Mark Meredy. Today we will also vote on the following pieces of legislation. Resolution 372, sponsored by Councilmember Rita Joseph, calls on the New York City of Education to provide support for a student newspaper at every high school, recognizing the important role of student journalism. I also want to acknowledge our students that are here today from the Youth Journalism Coalition who advocated for this resolution. Thank you, scholars, for your hard work, and thank you for being here. <laughs> Introduction 745A, sponsored by Majority Leader Amanda Farias, would require the Department of Transportation to publish information on its website about bicycle and micromobility ridership in the city, as well as a description of the projects it is undertaken to enhance the safety and movement of cyclists and other micromobility users on the streets and bridges under its jurisdiction. This bill will provide a transparent, data-driven perspective into the work of the department to keep New Yorkers and all street users safe. The website will be updated monthly when data is available and at least once per year. Now I invite Majority Leader Farias to the podium to discuss her legislation. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Speaker, for letting me speak about the bill. I'm proud to be passing my bill today, Introduction 745 requiring DOT to conduct an annual study on cycling activity in the city for the previous year. On the DOT website, it reads that New York City's Department of Transportation's goal is to accelerate the growth and sa of safe cycling by providing a system of bicycle routes that traverse and connect all five boroughs, while also creating a dense, fine-grained network of bike lanes in communities where cycling is already a popular mode of transportation. Intro 745 ensures that this is not just the goal, but the standard by bringing concrete data to the table to assess and reassess what works, what's not working, and where we need additional services. With more than 900,000 New Yorkers riding a bike regularly and our city's concerted effort to build more bike lanes, it is clear that transit safety and innovation is a top priority for this council. The study outlined in the legislation will require the department to identify key information like frequently biked streets and bridges to be able to make data-driven improvements to micromobility citywide. The study and the legislation will work to maintain New York City's status as one of the most transit-rich cities in the world and allow for more people to feel comfortable on a bike and for our cyclists and delivery workers safer on their daily rides. I would be remiss if I did not take a small moment to also speak about Bronx Metro North as already mentioned in detail by the speaker. The success of this rezoning and the modifications we're voting on today is really a testament to the City Council's collaboration, our dedication to the community that raised us and our love for our home borough of the Bronx. Not only will this rezoning bring much needed affordable housing, more local jobs, greater transit accessibility, but we'll also see substantial infrastructure upgrades throughout the surrounding areas that have been desperately needed for generations to come. Thank you for the additional time and thank you all. Thank you. 
Introduction 460A, sponsored by Councilmember Sandra Ung, would require the Department of Homeless Services, or DHS, to report on the feasibility of contracting with community-based organizations to accept and process applications for shelter intake for families with children. The Commissioner of Homeless Services would be required to deliver the report to the Mayor and Council no later than one year after this bill goes into effect. I invite Councilmember Ung to discuss her bill. Thank you, Speaker. Today, with the passage of Intro 460, we will take an important step toward making our city shelter system more accessible and compassionate for homeless families for children. Currently, families are forced to navigate a system that asks them to travel miles, often with young children, to reach the PATH Intake Center in the Bronx, the only intake center for families in the five boroughs. No family should endure the added burden of a long, difficult trips across the city just to access emergency shelter they desperately need. However, we know the first stop for many families in crisis is not the PATH Center, but their local community organizations. The same organizations that's been working tirelessly on the front lines, providing culturally competent and in-language service that immigrant community rely on. These community-based organizations are trusted. They present where families live, and they're already doing much of this important work. They should be empowered to do even more. That's why this legislation is so important. By requiring the Department of Homeless Service to study the feasibility of partnering with these local not-for-profits to process shelter intake applications. We are taking a common sense approach to serving homeless families where they're at, rather than making them come to us. I look forward to working closely with the Department of Homeless Service as they conduct this study. Together, we can find ways to streamline the intake process and reduce the unnecessary stress placed on some of our city's most vulnerable residents. This is about making our system work better for those who need it the most. I'm confident with the support of my colleagues and partners community, we can achieve that goal. Thank you to Speaker Adams for leadership and support, and I look forward to City Council's vote in intro 460. Thank you. Thank you very much. And introduction 123A, sponsored by Deputy Speaker Diana Ayala, would prohibit DHS from requiring children to be present in person at an intake facility when their family applies or reapplies for placement at a homeless shelter. There is an exception for when DHS requests to remotely view a child and is unable to do so within 24 hours, or when a child has not checked into their assigned shelter by the shelter's curfew on the day following placement. I invite Deputy Speaker Ayala Ayala to the podium to talk about her legislation. As she melts. As I melt. I think I'm convinced that I'm allergic to the lights. Um, but thank you, and I, I really want to shout out uh, Councilmember Ung's bill because I think that it's an important bill. I think, you know, most people think of it as a, you know, something new, and it's actually something that, you know, used to be done uh, many years ago. When I was in, in shelter, there were PATH centers throughout every borough. Um, the fact that we are now limited to just one and that people from far away deep into Queens would have to then, you know, travel under the stress that they're already, you know, facing, right, and feeling um, at the threat of, of, of being homeless um, is, is a difficult process. It's, it's a, it's, it, we don't want to add any undue burden on anyone. And so looking at different innovative ways that are cost efficient um, to ensure that that we have this service at every borough is really important. But while we're doing that, uh, my bill, what my bill would do is very simple, is that it would not require that a parent bring a child with them, right? That we can uh, video chat and, and still have that connection with that child and know that that child is part of that family. Um, but not have to subject that parent from having to bring the child physically to PATH and sit there for hours and hours on end, which is uh, what happens. During the pandemic, um, the, the, the agency opted to do virtual, uh, which was great, which is kind of the intent of this bill. So this bill will simply now codify what they're already doing. Um, and I, you know, I, I want to thank them for that because, I, I, again, you know, and I, I keep coming back to my story, but I remember going into to shelter and I had a, a one-year-old in a carriage 
They don't want to sit there. They're hungry. They're restless. They don't want, you know, want to sit in one place uh, for a certain amount of time. And sometimes at that, you know, back then, um, it could have been anywhere of, you know, 24 to 36 hours. Uh, we've re since reduced that, so families have to be placed somewhere um, by a certain time. But it's still hours and hours that children and you know would have to endure those conditions, um, creating the stress factor, you know, uh, that we're trying to eliminate for those families. So I'm, I'm really excited about the bill and, um, you know, equally excited about Sandra's uh, bill as well. And thank you so much. Thank you. All right. That concludes our stated agenda. With that, we will take on topic questions. Thank you, Andrew. You know, as with any um, with any entree into building, new building, it, it's something that certainly doesn't happen overnight. So this will take a while to happen. We're talking about 7,000 units. We're talking about a lot of other amenities and um, a major, major facelift to three districts in the Bronx. So I agree with you in that um, in the immediate future, we may not see as much as we need to see in the immediate future, but certainly this is going to address the larger scale need for housing and more housing in the city of New York, particularly in those three districts in the Bronx. Can yeah, thank you. Oh, yes, Amanda, please. I just want to add, oh, sorry about that. Just, just want to add on a little bit to what the speakers also stated. A part of this and a part of the negotiations that we went through is also looking at the five-year and 10-year capital plan throughout the agencies and their commitments. And so not only are we looking at outwardly into a timeline around the housing, we also got solid commitments for FY26, FY27 in our schools, in our parks, in the street infrastructure, in sewer um, improvements. So there are things that are the people are going to immediately see uh, within the next handful of years, dynamics that are going to shift, seats that are gonna open up, programs that are gonna happen in schools, bathrooms that are gonna be renovated in parks. Um, some of these parks are also jointly operated parks that are gonna also benefit the students at the school. So there are parts of these investments um, and we, where I'm happy to share with you all the, the things that I got committed um, and we secured, but we're going to see improvements over the course of years as the housing is also getting built. And so that people are going to be able to hold on to and see the immediate benefit, their tax, tax dollars at work um, through this commitment, even though we're going to be waiting for some of the housing to be built. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> Oh, thank you for the question, Michelle. You know, um, the negotiation of uh, neighborhood rezoning, it, it uh, doesn't really determine the expected negotiation on a citywide text amendment um, that's not yet before us for review. Um, so it, it's difficult to draw conclusions as to what one has to do with the other. The City of Yes proposal is is very vast, it's wide, and it's, it's particular um, for every district in the City of New York. So it's a little bit different, um, but as we always do, and you heard the, the great negotiation from this one here, um, from things that happen in negotiations regarding housing and the elements around, the amenities around um, housing, the council is going to examine and negotiate every application on its individual merit. Yeah. <laughs> Do 
I just answered that part, yeah. And I'm gonna let uh, Councilmember Farias sure. answer the first part. So I think for the most part, what we tried to do, especially between Councilmember Marmorado and I, we border one another, we have the housing applications as well, and hopefully we have an interconnected network of, of improvements. So for myself on my, my side of town, we secured nearly $200 million and uh, commitments on in terms of different infrastructure, something that Councilmember Marmorado and I share, our 170 million in like sewer local infrastructure, about 70 million in Department of Transportation efforts. So yes, I think there were a lot of um, conversations around how can we ensure that there's an interconnected network? How do we make sure communities that are shopping in one another's communities, that our students are going into one another's schools, visiting each other's parks, um, have a better flow of traffic, of mobility, um, of uh, shared spaces? Um, and so there was a lot of workings around there on the items that we secured um, between some of the larger infrastructure project projects around safety infrastructure, lighting, um, even getting like MTA commitment to have security personnel on each of the sites and to have uh, um, cameras and things like that that we are both of our communities shared in asking for. Um, does that answer your question? And we can give you a breakdown too yeah. on the commitments. Well, we secured near we secured over 500 million dollars in commitments from the administration on all four stations and the housing projects that are within this application so that involves looking at parking studies for example in councilmember salamanca's district or in councilmember riley's district where he has expanded bus service there to additional 10 million for the 49th precinct in councilmember marmorado's district and items that we shared in our parks schools street infrastructure lighting uh, sewers and and uh, pipes and things like that to prevent flooding, uh, things like that. So we, I can totally send you the full breakdown of everything. Okay, yeah, so we shared a lot of those in terms of gunning for what were the improvements that we needed at, for our communities, but they were definitely spread across with securing over 500 million. Stay close. <laughs> You know, um, th there are going to be a lot of dynamics in play for City of Yes, um, a lot. Um, as you've seen the results coming through community boards, other places, the hearings have been really, really informative as far as what the communities want. So we're going to have interesting negotiation around and fully, fully want the communities involved in that. So yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be dealing with a lot of different um, aspects of negotiation. Um, as far as uh, nudging, uh, colleagues, uh, our goal, and I've made no secret uh, for anybody in this room, you all know this, our intention when it comes to great projects for the city is always to get to a yes. That is our goal. Um, that is our commitment to New Yorkers for getting housing and getting affordable housing and getting good things for the city, um, getting new things for the city, is for, um, you know, for us to be in agreement that that is what the right thing is. So, you know, according to each council, member how we get there what they need per their community involvement and what the community is telling them likewise my own district when when these things happen in southeast queens it, it depends on what the community is telling us their input uh, whether or not we can make that happen for them and uh, how much it means to us to put that in play when it comes to negotiation so absolutely Hi, Derry. Yay. Great question. 
What is the council going to do to support the efforts that we're putting forth in Councilmember Joseph's legislation regarding um, journalism and newspapers? First of all, we've got the bill going. Um, thanks to you all. So that's that's the first and most critical thing is that this has to happen once it passes the city council. Um, and it's a, of course, it's something else where the council most definitely when it comes to items, particularly around our students, we like to put our money where our mouths are. So where it takes, you know, the funding to make it happen uh, for our students, the council is absolutely going to support in a funding capacity as well. Thank you, Derry. Look who you're asking. It's not on topic, Jeff. Off topic. Thank you. Um, speaker, on yes. Randy Mastro, which honestly is kind of on topic since you guys are formally accepting the nomination yep. today. Um, have you made up your mind where you're standing on his nomination? And do you think there's any chance that his nomination can actually be confirmed by this council? The, great question. Thank you, Chris. Um, I take the lead from my members, um, particularly when it comes to appointments um, to different places, shared spaces between the administration and the council. Um, the process is going to start, as you said, uh, formally after receiving the nomination at today's stated meeting. And then we've got a hearing on August 27th to hear from the nominee and the public. So we're going to get a full scale um, of uh, everything that everybody's been asking about for months. Uh, we'll finally get it um, aired out in the public space where it should be. And, um, and we'll see what happens from there. Well, um, I've heard I've heard from him personally. We have met, so I've heard from him personally. So he will be sharing those things, I'm sure, um, and uh, just hoping um, to hear uh, more about his record, um, more about how collaborative energy can be used for both sides of City Hall. So, in other words, you haven't made up your mind totally yet on where you stand. Right? I, I have not. I will be curious to know what goes on in those hearings. Um, and again, you know, I, I take a lot of input from my members um, who will have a lot to say, um, you know, about the nomination itself. Yeah. Ethan? Ethan? Uh, speaker, I have a couple of questions about lawsuits. So, well, possible lawsuits. So, regarding the uh, solitary ban bill. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, as far as solitary is concerned, we are considering our legal options to ensure compliance with the law. Um, but the fact is, Ethan, that we sh shouldn't be in the position in the first place uh, to deal with this, where the executive branch is abusing its authority to defend solitary confinement, which makes everybody less safe, as we know. Um, declaring a state of emergency simply to block a law from going into effect on the day before its effective date is an unprecedented abuse of power. So uh, we're going to be taking, at, uh, taking a look at um, our legal options where that's concerned. As far as City FEPS is concerned, um, once again, we strongly disagree, which you know, uh, with the decision, and we do a plan to appeal in a higher court. So we'll have more to say on the impact once that happens. Thank you. Hi, Hi Kelly. I'm good, I thank you. A couple of different questions. Mm -hmm. Following up on Mastro, yep. I know you said you haven't made up your mind, but what type of conversations or things you're telling your members going into that hearing? I know many of them have made up their minds, but have, are you telling them to give them a fair chance? You know, what, what do those conversations look like? I also wanted to ask you, there's currently support for proposed legislation that would, would require hotels to be licensed. Uh, where do you stand on that uh, proposed legislation? And if you agree with it, how do you manage the safety concerns the bill seeks to address with sex trafficking with the potential for added cost to the hotel industry? Okay, thank you. Um, again, uh, with um, Randy Mastro's nomination uh, and the members, the hearing will um, be our determining factor 
once the members have a chance to present their questions uh, to Mr. Mastro, I think that is going to be uh, even a greater help as far as, you know, perceptions, uh, record, all of those things. Um, as far as the, uh, the hotel bill is concerned, we, you know, w what we're seeing is a, a bill going through the legislative process, and it really is a testament to the value of a legislative process that's transparent and allows for public input, really, as opposed to what the Charter Revision Commission did. So uh, we will be seeing this legislation through. Um, we've had a lot of input so far on what the final final will look like, and that's what we're dealing with right now, trying to, uh, you know, get to what that final will look like. And one last question. Mm -hmm. The races for 2025, the primaries are shaping up. Some of your members who are term limited are getting involved in some of those races. I wanted to know if you're supporting any of them, you've spoken to any of them, what are your thoughts as we go into next year? I, I've, I've spoken with a few of, a few of them have spoken with me, I'll put it that way. <laughs> I, I don't want to know anything. Um, but, you know, the reality is for me, um, it's still really, really early um, to make any determinations, you know, um, endorsements, whatever we want to call it. It's really, really early in the process, um, you know, for, for me to make any, any of those determinations. It's just interesting for me, as I'm sure it is for you also, to just watch as predicted how the dominoes fall you know, once one falls, how the others fall. So it's been an interesting thing for me to watch over the past week or so. You know, I'm, I'm excited about watching, but for me, it's still early in the process. Will you just be watching from the sidelines or do you plan to get involved? Ooh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just keep watching those dominoes. Hi. Great. Thank you. That's a great question about restorative justice. And, you know, as you, you mentioned, the 70 million. Um, and through that allotment, I think that it tells a really, really um, great story of the council's commitment to restorative justice and our commitment, um, you know, to maintaining those programs. What we're going to continue to do, um, like I said, for, you know, the question, a previous question, which had to do with a lot of our concern in the council is that we continue to support those programs. You know, um, we're not going to shy away from supporting things that we think are going to uplift um, our youth first and foremost, um, you know, and others in, you know, in our society that need, that need our help and need our support. So we're going to continue to do what we have to do. We're going to continue to make sure that we have the best organizations, programs involved. Um, as individual council members, we're really, really close to the programming in our different districts. So we're going to continue to keep an eye on that um, and stay very, very close to those programs, those providers, um, and uh, take a look at the results also that those programs produce. That's our commitment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question, um, Jeff. I think that we were really uh, clear on the day that the, uh, that the commission voted that we do not support uh, the, uh, their proposals uh, for several reasons, um, and, and some of them I did state in the beginning. So um, as far as campaigns against, uh, we don't really have anything, uh, you know, amped up yet to answer that question, but I can let you know that uh, whatever our response is, it will be very, very vocal.
been any discussions between you and the mayor or the mayor and anyone on your leadership team about confirming um, the mayor's pick for the corporation council? No. Well, you're, you're, you're injecting the mayor into those conversations, so that's what I was responding to, so no. Uh, the meeting between myself and Mr. Mastro happened because Mr. Mastro requested a meeting, as he has with several council members, if not uh, pretty much a whole. No. Not to me, no. What was the meeting like? Hey, Chris. Chris, you're out of order. <laughs> What was the, it, it was a meeting. It was a it was a meeting like we have. <laughs> As far as the IBO is concerned, uh, I liked the article. Um, uh, I like the thought behind the article, and I would like to see some more energy. I don't know, Sandra, if you want to add any more, since you've got a bill in there. Yeah, there you you know, yeah. there's, a there is a resolution. I do have a resolution um, that do change um, the elections. Um, I do believe in it. That's why I introduced it. I think it's, you know, better. It increases voter turnout. Frankly, that's where I was looking at it, to make sure, like, you know, all communities have the, you know, better opportunity to come out to vote. And studies have shown that, that you know, if you change it to even year elections, that more communities of color will come out to vote. Uh, well, we're still, as with everything else, my standard answer is always going through the legislative process and we'll see where we get to at the end of it. Yeah. Oh, 2025. Oh, that's easy for me to answer. I, I pretty much answered it. Um, for me, it's still very early in the process. Um, personally, I'm really, really thankful to have, you know, multiple options available. I come from corporate world. Um, and I've also been in been an elected official for over seven years. So I have the best of both worlds at my feet. I'm really happy. So um, as I, you know, said to Kelly, let's keep an eye out for those dominoes. Well, what I will say is that um, I think that folks are conflating the uh, the pandemic outdoor dining uh, emergency actions with now the post pandemic legal actions and um, you know the uh, the efforts that now you know have come forward, which I believe regulation is necessary because that was an emergency situation. So, Well, I think the law is the law right now, and that's where we stand, or where we are. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Who wanted the picture? Oh, students. Students, come up.